So let's go ahead and uh, begin our talk, our last talk, the, the Day of Atonement and the Feast Days, God's Hidden Plan for Human History. When you read the Bible stories, do you see only the specific historic event, or do you see a bigger picture in each story? Do you see God's prophets giving messages? Do you see a centurion? Do you see violence before the flood? Do you see the dragon who's wroth with the woman? Do you see the, the, the Last Supper, the creation, the high priest? Do you see these stories as individual standalone historic events, facts, things that happened in the past? Or do you see a larger reality, something bigger going on? The ancient Israel, in my view, real historic people who did real historic things accurately recorded in Scripture. I think the Scripture is a good historical uh, book that gives us histories of real people who really lived. As the Bible says, but it's an example, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. You know, there were millions of people who lived in the past, but only a few individual lives are recorded. Is it possible that our infinite God, while he le left and leaves all of us free to make the decisions and, and how our life unfolds and the decisions we make, so he's not causing people to do certain things, but is it possible he can look down from heaven and say, you know what, we're going to record this life in Scripture, and we're going to record this life in Scripture, and we're going to record that life in Scripture, that he can choose from people and put in Scripture the people he wants not only to tell historically accurate things of what they did, but they become a part of a larger reality, teaching a larger picture. Is that possible? Well, did you know there are seven miracle births in Scripture? I think these are historic, not virgin births, miracle births, meaning seven women who had a physical health problem of their reproductive organs where they were infertile. They prayed to God. God performed a physical healing restoring their reproductive organs, and then they got pregnant through normal means with their husbands. Seven miracle births. And all seven, I think, are historic. I think they happened, but they also all teach a larger reality. They teach something about our Savior. Sarah had a child, Isaac. He was the promised one who was sacrificed. Jesus is the ultimate promised one who was sacrificed. Rebecca had a child, Jacob. Jacob struggles in the with God to overcome his own fear, and after he struggles, he's renamed Israel, becomes the father of a nation, built on the 12 sons. Jesus, as our incarnate God, is tempted in every way just like we are, struggles with the temptations of fear and selfishness, overcomes those temptations, and builds the church on the 12 apostles. Rachel has Joseph, sold by his brothers into slavery, becomes the ruler of the people, and saves the, saves the family and becomes the ruler of the people. Jesus became a servant, and saves the people and is exalted to become the ruler. Manoah's wife has Samson, blessed with incredible strength, delivers Israel from its oppressors and becomes a ruler or a judge over the people. And Jesus, of course, incredible strength, delivers us from the oppressors and becomes the ultimate ruler. Hannah had Samuel, who became the high priest. And Jesus, of course, is our high priest. The Shunammite woman had a child who died and rose again. And Jesus, of course, died and rose again. Elizabeth had John the Baptist, which was termed the greatest of all the prophets. And Jesus, of course, is the greatest of the greatest prophets, the greatest spokesperson for God of all. Do you see seven historical lives? Do you see seven lives that teach a bigger story? Ancient Israel, historically accurate people with historic events, yet teaching a larger reality. The annual feasts, as I understand it, are teaching the history of sin on earth, when Adam and Eve sinned, all the way to the earth made new, the restoration and freedom from sin. The first of the annual cycle, and they repeated this every year, and they just acted out the whole drama every year. The first of the annual cycle is Passover. As soon as Adam and Eve fell into sin, God passed over their sins. It says in Romans 3.25, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Christ is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. 
At Passover, they took the blood of the slain animal and put it in the doorpost, and then the death angel passed by those, and they were able to then leave this enslavement, uh, the Egypt and slavery, symbolically teaching that at the Passover, those who partake of Jesus Christ and put his life in their heart, then they don't die and they are freed from the slavery of sin. The time covered from the Passover is from Adam's sin all the way up to Christ's victory at the cross. That's the historical period of earth's history covered by the Passover. Unleavened bread. Immediately after Adam sinned, God begins dispensing truth unmixed with error, symbolized by the bread without leaven, to nurture, that we are to ingest the truth, to nurture and to save. But it was internalized. The truth was being taken in by people in sin and thus the bitter herbs. It was bitter to have to be truthful about our situation, our condition, and what was going to transpire now because of sin. This also is represented, representing the time from Adam's sin all the way up to Christ's victory at the cross. Eating of the unleavened bread symbolizes the internalization of Jesus Christ. And these are symbols. It was in the Old Testament, the eating of the meat, and uh, Jesus said in John 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. This became bread and wine. And you think about it as you take a piece of bread into your body, the molecules get broken down and become actual physical building blocks of the tissues of your body. As you partake of the bread, which is symbolic of the Word made flesh, taking of the flesh of Jesus, which is the words, the words of truth, as you partake of the truth and internalize that into your mind, the truths become building blocks of ideas, concepts, beliefs, which become to formulate your character and transform your heart. Thus we are to partake of the truth, as Jesus revealed, the bread. Feast of first fruits. The first fruits over the victory of death, over the victory of sin that causes death and death. The wave sheaf represents Jesus, who is the ultimate first fruit, and who rose again in sinless perfection. Those who arose with him on resurrection morning and were taken into heaven with him, they are the first fruits of God's plan of the ultimate harvest when all are restored, but these are the first fruits taken with him on resurrection morning. Feast of Weeks. This is Pentecost. This is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit to apply what Christ achieved and bring forth the harvest of healed souls. This occurred after Christ's death on the cross and the benefits were being uh, spread to spread the benefits and achieve a harvest of, of, of healed souls. This feast symbolically spans the time of Pentecost, AD 33, all the way up to the loud cry. which is the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is calling the people, alert, be ready, be prepared. A special message is coming, a special end time message. Alert yourselves, calling people with a loud cry to awake and prepare people, get ready to be reconciled and brought back into unity with God because we're getting ready to be reconciled or at one with him and meet him again. This Feast of Trumpets, late 18th, early 19th century, it's a great awakening in America and around the world. And then the Feast of Atonement. This is the actual reconciliation or being brought into oneness with God again. This is the healing and restoration of Christ-like character within settling into the truth so that nothing can shake you from it. This began in the mid-19th century and is continuing on today and will continue on all the way until the second coming of Christ. And then the Feast of Tabernacles. After we've been restored to unity or at oneness with God in heart, mind, character, then Christ returns and we tabernacle with him again in an earth made new. Thus, on the Feast of Tabernacles, they would build booths made out of um, green bows, and this was symbolic of tabernacling and living with God again in our Eden home made new. We're going to spend most of our time now talking about where we find ourselves in history today. And where we find ourselves in history today, and this is the special meaning for the end time, is in the Day of Atonement, and the fulfillment of that Day of Atonement, and what's going on that's, that we need to do, if anything, that can accelerate us moving into the, the next phase, because that's the exciting phase, right? 
Well, the Day of Atonement period began in the late 18th, early 19th century. A Baptist preacher named William Miller, he began preaching based on a prophecy of Daniel 8.14, 2,300 years, and the sanctuary would be cleansed. And Miller's study, and I won't go into all the things that Miller studied, but he came to view that this 2,300-year period began in 457 B.C. and in calculating in all the ways he's did, and if you're interested in that, that can be provided for you. But he calculated that that time period would end in 1844. And therefore, he began to preach that the Lord's prophetic period was going to end in 1844, and the cleansing of the sanctuary would happen, and he taught that the sanctuary was the earth, and thus he began teaching that Christ was coming back in 1844. And this contributed to a great revival and was part of the great awakening that you can read about in any encyclopedia that, that swept across North America and parts of the world. Prepare to meet Jesus. This is part of that atonement, that, that, that message. But I think we all know Jesus didn't come. So it led to the great disappointment. And the people that were caught up in the, in the Millerite movement were people from all denominational backgrounds. At this time in history, there was no Seventh-day Adventist denomination yet. But the Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church today that continues to teach this idea of a cleansing of a sanctuary. A group of the people from various denominational groups after 1844, over the next 19 years, studied together and eventually formed together an official church called the Seventh-day Adventist church. And we should give thanks to the Seventh-day Adventists for keeping this idea, this construct, this feast day cleansing aspect alive in our hearts and minds, because without that, we might not even consider the implication for us today, and we want to consider and see what that meaning is all about. Seventh-day Adventist view, and I take this from a book called The Seventh-day Adventist Belief, uh, page 312, and this is a way that many people within the Seventh-day Adventist organization uh, conceive of this idea of the cleansing of sanctuary today, how often many people will describe it. 2300 days ended in 1844, they agree with w William Miller. Sanctuary was not the earth, but a building, a construct in heaven. Christ entered the most holy place of this heavenly construct uh, in 1844, and he began to cleanse the building, the sanctuary, from the sins of the people that were recorded there. This required investigation of various records and examination and making judicial pronouncements or findings whose sins have been pardoned and whose have not. Some were removed and some were not. All cases of the professed followers of Christ are reviewed in the record books in this judicial process going on in heaven. God's judgment is also being vindicated because his record and his record review is open to all the onlooking universe so they can see why he expunges this person's record and doesn't expunge that person's record and that God is vindicated and only expunging those who have claimed the, the legal right through Jesus Christ and his accomplishments. This period of time ends in human probation, ends human probation, and culminates in the second coming of Christ. This is a general overview, which many people in the Seventh-day Adventist organization have, uh, are, are, are familiar with or may even present. But this entire doctrine, as I just presented it to you, is typically taught as a legal process. Investigation of records, legal accounting, judicial findings, Rendering legal judgments. Removal of the record of sins from books. This legal view is all predicated upon one single idea that God's law functions no different than the law sinful human beings make. And I'm going to suggest to you, and I'm going to demonstrate to you, that in fact, the idea that God's law functions no differently than human law is the lie from which the sanctuary is to be cleansed. That is the lie. How do you see God in his law? Do you see God as designer or dictator? Designer, God is the builder of space, time, energy, matter, life. His laws are the laws upon which reality are built. Laws of physics, laws of health. But some people say, yeah, but the moral laws. Yeah, think about the moral laws. 
Why is it wrong to commit adultery? Because God has a rule, and you broke his rule, and he's got somebody to keeping record, and he's got a demerit in your book in heaven, and now God is legally required to use his power to put punishment on you unless you get a legal payment made. Is that the problem with committing adultery? Or does the person who commits adultery actually sear their conscience, warp their character, harden their heart, damage their soul, corrupt their individuality? And if they are not restored they become further and further away from Christ and more and more like Satan in character. You see, the moral laws are also design laws. You cannot violate God's moral law without damaging yourself. It's not possible. Or do you see God as a dictator? His laws are simply a system of rules like human beings make. We can't make space, time, energy, matter, life. We can't do it. So we make up rules, and then we tell you if you break our rules, we will punish you. We will inflict harm on you to make you regret breaking our rules. Is that how you see God? Well, the Bible says the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus taught that all law hangs on love for God and love for your neighbor. God, as designer, built the universe to operate in harmony with his nature of love. Romans 1.20 tells us that God's divine nature is seen in what he has made so that men are without excuse. And you've heard this one before, but I'm going to say it again. Every breath you take, you give away carbon dioxide to the plants. And the plants give oxygen back to you, a never-ending circle of giving upon which life is built. Yet you are still free to transgress that law. You could take a plastic bag, tie it over your head, and selfishly hoard your carbon dioxide to yourself. But the wages of that is death. This is what the Scripture is trying to teach us. Deviations from God's law are deviating from how he's constructed life to exist, and life cannot exist out there. You will die. Christianity, Jesus, was founded on Jesus, and Jesus came to give his life for others. He gave of his energies constantly for the welfare of others, ultimately sacrificing his life for our salvation. And the Bible teaches greater love has no man that he give his life for a friend. This is how we know what love is, that Christ gave his life for us, and we ought to give our lives for our brothers. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but the one who gives his life for me will find it or save it. You see, the early church, the apostolic church, practiced the principles of love. They gave. They lived communally. They shared. They refused to war against Rome. They didn't become political. They died as martyrs in the arena. This is how God's kingdom was established on earth. But something changed in Christianity. How they understood God's law, and therefore how they understood God. Daniel prophesied that a power would arise and seek to change God's law, Daniel 7, 25. How did the idea of God's law change? Notice I said the idea, because we can't change God's law. How did the idea change? Imperialism. The idea that God's law is not design law, not protocols of reality, but it's simply functionally no different than the kinds of laws human beings make. That idea became accepted within Christianity as a whole. Eusebius, the first church, and again, I want to emphasize church historian, wrote, with the Roman Empire monarchy had come on earth as the image of the monarchy in heaven. Get your mind around the implications here. A few hundred years after this Roman Empire monarchy crucifies the Savior, the church is teaching that this imperialistic dictatorship is the image of God's government in heaven. Anybody see a problem with that? Evidence of this change, that this this core change within Christianity is the imperialistic construct of law. What church committee ever voted to change the law of gravity, the law of respiration? You know, I I, I travel around. California had bad fires. We get really bad pollen around here. Wouldn't it be nice that if your church voted that when when the pollen count gets over 1,000, over 2,000, over 3,000, members of your church won't have to breathe on those days? Why do we not vote for that? Because you recognize you're laughing because you know it's ridiculous. You can't change that law by a vote. So what would it mean if a church did vote to change God's law? That would mean, it would be evidence they don't see God's law as design law. They just see it as imposed rules that are subject to change. And in fact, that's what the church did. Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 4, page 153. Uh, The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath to the seventh day of the week, 
uh, to the first uh, to make the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. This is not an argument over Sabbath Sunday, guys. This is simply evidence to show that the church saw God's law subject to change, which means they don't see it as design law, they see it as imposed rules. Lawyers changed the law. This is Lindsay's book on the history of the Ref- excuse me, Lawyers Changed the Church. This is Lindsay's uh, book, A History of the Reformation. The great men who built the Western church were almost all trained Roman lawyers. Tertullian, Cyprian, Augustine, Gregory the Great, whose writers formed the bridge between the Latin fathers and the schoolmen, were all men whose early training had been that of a Roman lawyer, a training which molded and shaped their thinking. Whether theological or ecclesiastical, they instinctively regarded all questions as a great Roman lawyer would. They had a lawyer's cravings for exact definitions. They had the lawyer's idea that the primary duty laid upon them was to enforce enforce obedience to authority. Get your mind around that. Imperialism, authoritative rule. Whether the authority expressed itself in external institutions or precise definitions of the correct way to think about spiritual truths. We have a creed. We have a doctrine. We have a 27 or 28 fundamentals. We are going to enforce that. There's going to be a test here. You're going to be policed. If you don't believe this way, we'll put you at the stake. We'll have the, we'll have the crusades. We'll have the Inquisition. We will enforce orthodoxy. This is imperialism. No branch of Western Christendom has been able to free itself from the spell cast upon it by these Roman lawyers of the early century of the Christian church. Daniel prophesied, God prophesied through Daniel, that a power was going to arise and he was going to wage war against the saints of God, defeating them, winning, until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints. Question for you guys, what kind of war? 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with, they're not weapons of the world. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. And you'll notice what we demolish. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against, here's the core issue in this war. We, we destroy those things that set themselves up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to Jesus Christ. Now, if you have a war over arguments, pretensions, knowledge, thought, Where's the battlefield? The battlefield's in your mind, and the core issue that you are being attacked on is your concept of God. That's the core issue that your mind has been attacked on. Get your mind, I hope you're hearing me, your mind has been attacked with the God constructs that you've been taught. Paul's description of the little horn power. He describes the same power that Daniel just described. Here's Paul's description in 2 Thessalonians 2. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs to the man of lawlessness. Lawlessness, what's that mean? A man who is not in harmony with design law, with God's principles. He's saying that it's just arbitrary rules. I'm not going to live by how God constructed things. It's lawless to do that. The man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. Why is he doomed to destruction? Because he is persistent on stepping outside of God's design. So when you step out of God's design, it's like the man is doomed to die if he types a plastic bag over his head. He's doomed to do. He's doomed to destruction because he's rejecting God's protocols and designs for life. So the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Get your mind around that. We're, several, we're, we're 50, 60 A.D. here. Christ has died. He's risen again. He's ascended into heaven. Paul's saying there's a, there's a man of sin coming. There's a man of lawlessness coming. And he is going to uh, set himself up in God's temple. Does that mean Paul's saying this, this man of sin is going to rise up into heaven and knock Jesus off his throne up there and begin reigning in heaven? Is that what he's saying? No, he's not saying that. What temple does this man set himself up in, this lawless one? The spirit temple. The spirit temple. How? How could this man, after Christ's victory, set himself up in the spirit temple? By changing how we view God's law. From design law to impose law. 
As soon as that happened, as soon as you accept God's law functions like our law, instantly your version of God changes. God is no longer seeking to heal and restore those who have a terminal condition. Instead, God is a judicial magistrate who has keeping track of every wrong you've ever done, and he's got a record book of every deed that's bad. And if you don't get legal pardon, then God himself will be having a tribunal, and you're going to have to stand before him one day, and he will use his power to torture you before he kills you. That's the man of sin. Your mind has been attacked with a distortion about God. He's setting himself up in the spirit temple, proclaiming God is like me. And the world goes into an age of darkness, the dark ages. If the spirit temple is the temple defiled, then what temple do you think needs cleansing at the end of the 2300 years? How did God respond to the infection of his spirit temple with imperialism, with imperial false law constructs and a distorted version of his character? How did he respond? He prophesied that a time would come when the temple would be cleansed. He prophesied about that. 2,300 years and then my temple will be cleansed. Malachi describing the same event as Daniel 8.14. The cleansing of the temple. Notice what Malachi describes as being cleansed at the fulfillment of the 2300-year prophecy. Then suddenly the Lord you're seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Who are the Levites? What's being cleansed at the 2300? Levites are being cleansed. Who are the Levites? You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, 1 Peter 2.5. You are a holy priesthood being built into a spiritual house. The Levites are the priesthood of believers. These are what Christ cleanses when he comes to his temple. So what is the building material of the heavenly sanctuary? Or from what is the heavenly sanctuary constructed? If you use the scripture as your source, Ephesians 2, 19 and 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens of God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Is this sanctuary that I just read about in Ephesians, is that sanctuary being built by humans or not by human hands? Not by human hands. Zechariah, we read this one in our last talk. Jesus leaves his place in heaven. He branched, the branch branches out from his place in order to build the temple of the Lord. If the temple in heaven is just a building made out of concrete or gold or silver or inanimate material, why would Jesus need to leave heaven in order to build that temple? He didn't need to leave heaven to build a construct made out of inanimate materials. He needed to leave heaven to build a building made out of living stones. Revelation chapter 3, 12. When you get your mind around this idea, then suddenly many elements of Scripture come into focus. The heavenly sanctuary built out of living stones? Him who overcomes, Revelation 3, 12, him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and never again will he leave it. If we believe that the heavenly sanctuary is built out of inanimate materials, gold, silver, bricks, mortar, we're going to be imprisoned in that building forever. You're going to heaven, you're going to be locked in, and you never get to leave. Does that sound like heaven to you? But if you understand that the heavenly temple is built out of living beings, you are a pillar. And it doesn't matter where in the cosmos you travel, you're always a pillar in that temple, and you never leave it. Psalms 23, 6, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, is it an inanimate box? Are we in some imprisoned building? We never get to leave? 
Or are we always, eternally, once we're restored as a living stone in the unity of God, part of the construct? Is there a real... So people will come up to me. Somebody's bound to come up to me after this talk and say, do you believe that there's a real physical sanctuary in heaven? I've done this presentation a couple of times, and there's always one, if not two, they'll come up and say, do you believe there's a real physical sanctuary in heaven? Are people real physical beings? That's not a trick question. I believe in a real physical sanctuary in heaven. It's just a matter of, do you believe the Bible when it describes the construction material from which it is built? How does Christ cleanse the Levites? Daniel 7, 21, 22. I beheld, and the little horn was making war, and he prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Do you want to possess the kingdom? Okay, but, well, the, this, this man of sin is prevailing against God's people until judgment was given to the saints. What does that mean? What does it mean, judgment given to the saints? What law lens are you looking through? Are you looking through human-imposed law till some judicial pronouncement is ruled in your behalf by a magistrate somewhere in the universe? Is that what you think? Or design law, until judgment is given or imparted to the saints, meaning until you are given discernment, wisdom, understanding, the capacity to differentiate, as it says in Hebrews, the mature are those who develop by practice the ability to discern or judge the right from the wrong. This war is a battle. Your mind has been attacked by a distortion about God himself. And that, that attack has been winning until a time comes in which you are given discernment or judgment to tell the difference. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Satan is the father of lies. He has lied about God and misrepresents God's law to be like human law imposed rules. Christianity accepted the lie and now worships a God who functions no different than a sinful dictator, the source of inflicted pain and suffering. The temple must be cleansed. So how does he cleanse the Levites? Paul in Romans writes, Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Speaking of God. Why would God need to be judged? Imagine you're in a healthy, loving marriage and somebody tells your spouse a lie. They lie to your spouse and, and get your spouse to believe the lie that you're having an affair. And because your spouse believes the lie, your spouse is hurt. They leave, they move out. But you know your spouse is the victim of a liar. You still love your spouse. You want reconciliation with your spouse. What will you have to do to reconcile that relationship? Won't you have to prove your innocence? Isn't that what's necessary? Who's the one on trial? The innocent one is on trial, not the guilty. This is Revelation 14, 7. Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the fountains of water. If you read this through the imposed law construct, if you accept the distortion that God functions no different than human law, then you read this, be afraid, and you better be obeying the right rules and worshiping in the right way because God's keeping track of all your misdeeds and he's holding a tribunal right now and he's making a judgment on whether you're going to get in or you're going to get out. You better watch out, he's judging. Design law, though, be in awe of an amazing creator God of love. And reveal, give him glory, reveal his character of love in your life because the time has come in human history for people to make a right judgment about God and to worship him, the designer, the builder, the creator of all reality who built earth, heaven, sea, and all that in them is. Worship the creator. Stop worshiping this dictator view of God. It's time for the sanctuary to be cleansed. The big overview God prophesied a power would arise and infect the spirit temple with lies about him. After Christ's victory, this power would arise to do this. It would be 2,300 years before enough truth was recovered by people to cleanse their minds from the lies and restore trust. 
Now, you might be saying, well, why 20, 30 years? Because of the way God works. God is a God of love. You cannot, what God wants, he wants your friendship. He wants your trust. He wants your loyalty. He wants your devotion. He wants your love. You cannot get any of that with threats. You cannot get any of that with coercion. You cannot get any of that with the might and power. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by the way the Spirit works, says the Lord. And the Spirit is the Spirit of truth and love. And so God leaves us free, and he looks down the corridors of time. He's the source of truth. He's been raining truth down for, for, forever because he's eternally true. But there's a liar, a deceiver, who's working to obstruct the truth. And he looks down the corridors of time and he says, after Christ comes and dispels the darkness that had taken hold of the nation of Israel and he, and he wins the people and the apostolic church is practicing my methods, there will be a counterattack of this man of sin and he's going to infect the, the minds of people with this distorted view about God and the world's going to go into a darkness. But truth will continue to be revealed. Truth will continue to be poured out. But it's going to be 2,300 years before enough truth is recovered by the minds of men that they can fully reject these lies and have their spirit temple cleansed, which restores trust. Once we reject the lies and see God through his, we're one to trust. We open the heart. And we open the heart, the spirit comes in and cleanses and renews us in righteousness. This is at one meant, or atonement, restoring people to oneness with God, and then he will come again as it says in 1 John. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him face to face. God is working to restore us into his likeness, so when he comes, we can see him face to face without anything in between. So a historic view, I'm about to read you a little quotation from a woman who was part of the Millerite movement who believed William Miller's prophecies or predictions and was part of the expectation of seeing Christ come in 1844, went through the great disappointment. She was raised a Methodist, and after that great disappointment, she joined with some others and over the next 19 years studied and became one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And over 100 years ago, and I want you to contrast this description of over 100 years ago with what I read to you early about how many in the Adventist church teach this today. Because this is how one of the founders of the Adventist church taught it back then. I think you might see a difference. And keep in mind the Ephesians text we read earlier and the, and the Peter text about living stones built together in the house of the Lord and so forth. Keep those in mind as you hear this. The first tabernacle, built according to God's directions, was indeed blessed of him. The people thus were preparing themselves to worship in the temple, not made with hands, a temple in the heavens. The stones of the temple built by Solomon were all prepared at the quarry and then brought to the temple site. They came together without the sound of axe or hammer. The timbers were also fitted in the forest. The furniture was likewise brought to the house, all prepared for use. Even so, the mighty cleaver of truth has taken out a people from the quarry of the world and is fitting this people who profess to be the children of God for a place in his heavenly temple. We want the cleaver of truth to do its work for us. We are taken from the quarry of the world. The material must not be a dead substance but living souls. And these souls must be brought out of the quarry of the world where the hand of God can fit them for the temple in heaven. We are here as probationers and we must pass under the hand of God. All rough edges and rough surfaces must be removed and we must be stones fitted for the building. We are brought into church capacity with defects of character, but we must not retain them. We must be fitted and squared for the building. We must be laborers together with God, for we are God's husbandry. We are God's building. In view of this, we must see that our temple is not defiled with sin. We should be lively stones, not dead ones, but live ones that will reflect the image of Christ. Does that sound like that other thing I read earlier or talked about earlier? It sounds quite different to me. When you get your mind around this idea that we are living stones being built together in a house for the Lord, that the sanctuary in heaven is a real physical construct made out of living beings and you will be a pillar in the house of God, that the cleansing of the sanctuary is cleansing your heart, mind from lies and distortions, ultimately to cleanse you from fear and selfishness to restore righteousness within. Then when you see all that together, you can see other connections like the most holy place in the sanctuary is actually a metaphor for the New Jerusalem. Let me show you. 
The most holy place, if you've ever checked out its shape or structure, it's a cube. The New Jerusalem is a cube. The most holy place is covered in gold, showing the perfection of sinless universe in God's presence. The New Jerusalem is paved in gold, the perfection of God's love. The most holy place is where the saved are at one or unity with God. If the New Jerusalem, the saved are at one or at unity with God. The most holy place is where God dwells. The New Jerusalem is where God dwells. The most holy place, the high priest cleanses the most holy place. The high priest cleanses the hearts and minds of the church, which is his bride, and the bride of Christ, according to Scripture, in Revelation, is the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, which is cleansed by him, which is the most holy place. How was all this enacted in the symbols? How did the Day of Atonement symbolism actually enact everything I just told you? Well, first, there were two goats. One's the Lord goats, and one's the scapegoat. The Lord's goat was slain, blood was taken in the most holy place, sprinkled on the cover, and seven times before it. Then it was put on the horns of the golden altar, and seven times before it. Then the hands of the high priest were put on the head of the scapegoat, and the scapegoat was let out in the desert and let go. So what does all this mean? The two goats represent two opponents, Christ and Satan. Now some people immediately go, wait a second, hold on. They're uncomfortable with the idea of the goats representing the opponents. But look, look at Scripture. This is a common theme in Scripture. Yeast. Yeast represents the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of her flour till it worked its way through the whole dough, Matthew 13, 33. But be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then, of course, during Passover and communion, we must have unleavened bread or bread without yeast because the yeast represents sin. So we have yeast representing the kingdom of God and sin. What about a serpent? The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. The serpent represents Satan. Yet, in Numbers, Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten anyone, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. The serpent of brass represents Christ. Or the lion. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Yet... Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. It represents Jesus. How about light bearer? And Isaiah, talking of Lucifer. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? Yet Peter, describing Jesus until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. And the Greek here, translated morning star, referring to Jesus is phosphorus, from where we get phosphorus, and translated into the Latin in this text, Lucifer, until the Lucifer rises in your heart, because Lucifer means light bearer, and Jesus is the light which lightens all men. And so we have two opponents, two light bearers, and this is what the goats represent. We have two goats, two people proclaiming to be the way, the truth, and the life, two people claiming to we, we should follow them, two beings claiming that they are the, the light of the universe, but they're not. One sacrificed himself, and one did not. And the symbolism, the one goat sacrificed himself, and the one did not. The blood of the sacrificial animal represents symbolically the sinless, perfect life of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. The box under the lid we talked about earlier, remember, represents the hearts of sinful human beings who have been perfectly reconciled back to God in unity with Him again. The golden altar represents the converted hearts of people in the process of being reconciled into total unity with Him again. The horns of the golden altar represent the vestigial remnants of sin to be removed. So why sprinkle seven times? Seven, seven times is the number of perfection. This symbolic sprinkling of seven times is the work of sealing. It's also symbolic and represented in the Sabbath. When God finished his work, he rested. When Christ finishes his work on the cross, he rested. When Christ finishes his work of sealing and healing you, he rests. There's no more healing and sealing to do. It's symbolic of the seven times, the seven healing, sealing, perfection. The blood applied seven times in the most holy place symbolizes that God first heals and seals 
his spokespersons. In Revelation chapter 7, in the first few verses, an angel comes from the east telling the angels holding the four winds of strife, hold, 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 until an event happens, until my servants are sealed in their forehead. This is what's happening in the most holy place. They are sealed first. Those spokespersons are sealed. The servants are his prophets, not prognosticators. Prophets, if you look in history, are primarily the people who are sent by God with a message to the people of that day. And at the end of time, God is waiting for a group of people symbolically represented to be sealed first, and then the four winds loose. And when the four winds loose, terrible troubles happen. The rest of the world begins waking up. What's happening? This first group sealed gives the true message. They're the spokespersons of God. They tell what's happening in the world and why. And from their witness, later in Daniel, uh, Revelation 7, a great multitude that no one can count from every tribe, kindred, nation, and people are saved. The f- blood applied in the most holy place is sealing that first witness group. Because judgment starts with the house of God. We are the first to be able to make that right judgment and be settled into the truth so that nothing can move us. But then the blood is applied to the golden altar, which represents the sealing of that great multitude who respond to the witness of that first group sealed. And then, when someone believes a lie, what happens when the truth is understood and accepted? Two things happen. When when you believe a lie, and then you believe and understand and accept the truth, two things happen. One, the innocent is exonerated. And two the liar is exposed. Don't both things happen? Yes. The hands being placed on the head of the scapegoat represents that those who have been sealed with the truth and the character of God recognize now the source of the lies. And those lies are placed back on his head. You're the liar. You're the cause. You're the one who started this mess. There was never anything wrong with God. That's the symbolism. And here's what it says in Isaiah. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? How have you been cast to the earth, you who once laid low the nations? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in throne of the mounts of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Now notice, those who see you stare at you They ponder your fate. Is this the man that shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home. You see, we see him for who he is. It's on your head that we hold him accountable. So where do we find ourselves today here in 2018? In a war between two versions of God and his law. One, a God who is like Satan alleges, arbitrary, imposes rules, requires legal payments, is a source of inflicted punishment and death that some call justice. Two, the God that Jesus revealed, who is love and created all reality to operate in harmony with his own nature and character of love, the God who gave his life to save and to heal. People are settling into one of the two views. Those who love God and others more than self, such that they would give their lives for others. Revelation describes, Revelation 12, 11, these are they who do not love their life so much as to shrink from death. These are the sealed of God. These are the ones whose sanctuaries have been cleansed or solidified into selfishness, either believing the beastly methods of coercion They actually believe God is a a dictator. God makes rules. God is a source of inflicted punishment, that that it is righteous and just to, to, to hurt people who don't love you. Thus, they mark themselves in their foreheads. Or they practice the beastly methods of coercion and mark themselves in their hands. God is waiting for a people to be settled into the truth about him. Is God the kind of being Jesus revealed? Our designer who seeks to save and to heal us from our terminal condition? Or is God the kind of being Satan alleges, the imposer of law who inflicts pain and suffering and is the source of death unless he is propitiated by the blood of a human sacrifice? Whom will you serve? The choice is yours.